Good morning, everybody. This is your host, Bob McGoy. I want to welcome you to this Monday morning webcast. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn that over to Keith, and we'll go ahead and get started. All righty. So, welcome to our presentation. We're going to have yeah, an overview of color printing methods for the J750 and J735. Ah, tongue twister. We're going to start off with just kind of meeting the team, looking at some GrabCAD. Uh, a little bit of hands-on on importing some STLs into GrabCAD and getting you know, a little familiar there. And then if we have some time, I can pull up some of the uh, training uh, presentations from Stratasys. We can't go in too depth for those because those were four-hour classes each, and I have six of them. So we'll just be covering the overview of those. So hopefully that piques your interest. And there will be a lot more... Uh, information coming down the line via more webinars and blog posts as well. So let's first check out what Stratasys PolyJet has to offer. For most of you, hopefully you're familiar, that we use uh, inkjet printer heads to lay down a very fine mist of material that solidifies under a UV link or UV light source. And then uh, we use a mixture of model, both model and support, to create these uh, wonderful products. Here's um, what's it called? A nice video that illustrates that. Let's see. So in this one, we'll be dealing with the object and then the. No, oh, my other box didn't come in. But in fact, we'll be also dealing with Conix Three can handle some of this objects, but most of the I'll say later advanced stuff will be for the J750. The Conix Three still can do some of the. Um, things that we will be uh, dealing with. And then in my GrabCAD, I will be using the Vero, um, what's called, CMYK system to be blending. Uh, what's called, one of the newest and one of our more favorite uh, rubber-like materials is the Agilis. It's a lot more flexible than, Tango, than the Tango and a good amount more flexible than the Tango Plus, if you're familiar with those materials. But the uh, ability to color it is far superior than the former uh, types of rubber-like. So we'll also be messing around with a little bit of that. Um, the new Vivid Color line is amazing. Um, you can really make things pop with some uh, post-processing magic, I'll say. So if you've seen some of my other um, what's called post-processing webinars, this thing, or check out the uh, what's called uh, blog post as well, and then you can see how to do these, uh, making these uh, colors really pop like lenses. So just to give you a little bit more sample of all the fun colors that Vivid has to give. Now let's get into the GrabCAD uh, voxel print. So voxels, if anyone's familiar with pixels, it's just a 3D representation of a pixel in 3D space. So Voxel printing allows you to uh, have a lot more control. So every slice you can control the interaction of the materials with the surrounding materials and thus giving a very interesting um, control. In most cases, too much control, I'll say. 90% of uh, applications, people probably won't need to get into this level of detail, but there's a lot, there's a far range between color selection and then this end use of absolute control, which is voxel. So voxel is really cool because the things that you should think about if you want to use this is you have certain material properties, but you want to mix those. So you want to, instead of say doing like a bricklaying pattern, and putting Agilis as the mortar in between each one of those pieces of Vero, you can now swap out bricks, change the densities. You can make the bricks Agilis versus the uh, mortar now Vero for some reason. Like You can do a lot more interesting things with uh, voxel printing. And then, yeah, you can control the mesh of the like bone densities and you know, it, it's really being used in the, I'll say, research areas for like medical and uh, maybe a little bit of aerospace and automotive, like really getting down into like the actual properties for testing mechanics. Um, the other big part of the full color printing is in the stop animation, one of our 
favorite videos, I would highly recommend. We have a short amount of time. Otherwise, I would have us watch it now. It's like a six-minute video on YouTube, but it's Leica, Leica Studios did a Box Trolls and Kubo the Three Springs, or Three Strings, and most of all of their characters were 3D printed on the J750. And they go into detail how and what they were able to accomplish with using the uh, J750. So highly recommend going to see that. So here's uh, some samples that I just took a picture of in in house. Note these are the actual like vivid colors, pure cube slot, and then like in order to get these colors before we would have had to done a post processing uh, system. No, that. Uh, wrong thing. So this this is the uh, what's called. So we would have to stain or dye the material before. So we're using the Agilus here to try to get back to this vivid color. So you see how deep and amazing this red is. When we take a quick look over at these, you can't quite match the, the color quality if you're doing it by hand. This new vivid line allows you to actually control that color with, with certainty and repeatability. It's amazing. So that is um, one of my little I'll say, takeaways from the other events. So this was your uh, uh, digital ABS. These are your Agilus and different times that we soaked it into the dye. It's a very messy, stain-filled process, so I don't recommend playing around with it unless you really, really want to. So let's jump into our grab kit. So a lot of people, I hope you're using GrabCAD already. Uh, if not, I highly recommend you start. It allows you to do a lot of amazing things. There's one in the top, jigs and fixtures, advanced FDM settings for those of you who don't know about it, but we're going to stick within here. So this is one of my first color prints. I have a, let's go, a symmetry over here. And then I have a couple of different saved out. So in my SOLIDWORKS file, I created this as, um, was it three different parts? And then I saved it as three different uh, STLs that were able to pull together and then color with different materials. So in this one, I call it my little origami uh, flexible. Where's my, there we go. Yep, there was this. So what I was able to do is Take my pierced I am, take an orange, which I just picked from my color gradient, and then this middle part is just pure or nearly pure, or yeah, not quite pure agilis, a little bit of white mixed in. And then I can change all these different settings. So let me start over for you guys. So this is where we're going to try to get to, and I just want to show. What we want to do is, one of the big keys is to build that. If I do it the wrong way, so we want to add them as an assembly. If you don't, things will kind of mess up, and that's why you, so I'll just show you real quick. So if we add the models, uh, desktop, and we take the 4x4, four four. so these are the three parts, and we just open them. You'll note that they just kind of come in separate and there's no way to pull them together. So this is why we want to go into the file. And this is the silliest part, but yeah, this is a very important. And once you grab the, four, the three parts, it will auto lock it in. So now we got our parts and it's treating it as one assembly with three sub parts. This is the, uh, part that I'll say confuses a lot of people and why they can't get multiple colors on their like Conex 3s or other parts. So now that we have this piece, we have, you know, it's down, it's one solid color, but then we can select each individual part, go into our properties. Now we can change the colors. And this will, you know, there we go. Now I want this one. What color? Hello, black. There. So now we can add those colors in on the fly. 
So those would be the, I'll say, the quick, quick and easiest uh, tips for when you're using GradCAD is this add uh, what's it called STL assemblies so that they come together as one piece, and then you're able to go through and individually, you know, change what you want. And then even if you're say using the let's go like um, what's called the Connex 3 where you only can mix like two parts. So if we select here, this is representing like uh, the Connex 3. Hey, go back to digital. So I'm only able to choose digital colors that are a mixture of the Vero Black Plus and the Vero Clear, but I'm still able to get, you know, a grayscale part off of that, um, you know, STL assembly. So this is where you don't have to, you know, go into the next couple tricks that I'm about to show you guys. You can still stay within, you know, normal SOLIDWORKS, export as multiple STLs, import it as an assembly, and then change the colors to, you know, a grayscale if you're on a Connex 3, or you can go into the full color gambit of the J750 if you, you know, have one. Now, let's pull up, where's my, so that's the quick overview of, you know, GrabCAD. So keep those in mind. So one and two, whoop. blitz through a little bit of color theory with you, with everyone that you kind of understand where we're coming from. So note, anything you design on your screen, probably you've had this experience. If you go and try to 3D print it, even though it's a freeing experience from like CNC and traditional machining, you still have restrictions. There's always going to be, you know, everything you can imagine, you can't always create. There's always some uh, little bit of difference. So one of the big things is appearance. How do we deal with color? So you have to realize that there is a translucency, a texture, a gloss, and a the actual color that we're representing. So, and that comes to us in the like spectrum. There's this magic delta E, which is the number of different colors that we could ever possibly detect with our eyes. Younger people have a little bit wider, older people have less, and vice versa. So, now, here's a fun little game. Remember this dot. And we'll get back to it. There, yeah, it's a very important red dot. It's actually kind of funny because I'm looking on this. I have dual screens up right now, and they are two different colors, even though it's the same screen on mine. So if you have a dual screen, try to move it from one side to the other, and you'll see this example play out. <laughs> Just because it's one color combination of you know RGB or CMYK, depending on which screen it's on, it will change colors. So. Note that even though it may be the same color and it's printed the same way, everyone will see it slightly differently. And it's all about your color memory. So that includes, do you remember what that red dot looks like? And also, what was the other colors you're looking at right now? Is that affecting your memory of that color? Was that red dot surrounded by a bunch of white? Did you have, in my case, I have a big blue poster behind my screen. <laughs> that helps uh, you know, create a, a contrast. Age, reflectivity, angle of the screen, all of that kind of changes your color. And then here's another great example, of natural light, warm light, you know, cloud light, cold light, tungsten light, all of these change the colors and kind of the hue of the person, but it's all the same person. So it's a, it, when we start dealing with colors, we have to kind of really set the expectation that Things change depending on your light, and especially if you get into the marketing world and uh, products. Anyone who's dealing with that right now will know that color is a huge object. Then also dealing with the matte versus glossy. Um, one of the other former webinars where we actually sanded and then put a glossy coat over the parts to make them look as if they were printed glossy, even though they were printed matte. We can actually accomplish that with some post-processing things, so keep that in mind. Now. Time for the fun game. Which red was it? Da, 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 da. So let's see. Was it here? Actually, it's this one down here. So well, it's more of a rhetorical question, but see how many of you actually remember that um, color. Then here's the, uh, it looks like it's two different colors now, but they're actually 
two of the same colors just separated or put behind two different colors that are alternating can change your perception. Same thing here, another fun little eye catch thing. And what I'm trying to get down to is here's the important, as uh, Stratus has put it, the $1 million chart of color research that they had to pull together from people like the uh, was it Visible Light Institute, Pantone, RGB standard, CMYK, and then we have we have Pantone colors, which a lot of designers and people will use, is this big one out here. Our visible light spectrum, we can see a lot more greens, deeper purples, and blues and reds than we can recreate with our inks in the physical media. Uh, as also within the RGB and our screen technology as well. And you can see how there's this nice sweet spot down in here where everyone kind of plays nice except for there's kind of not that many choices of green, which is sad. I love green. Um, but once you get into, you know, the C or CMYK, this is your print media. This is where we usually play around with. We're not as, we have a different shape for Stratus printers, which I'll find in another slide further down, but it's very similar to the print media of, two, of paper and other cardboards and plastics we have to plan this little realm. And so we have a couple different ways of getting there, even if you pick a color that's, say, out here. We have an absolute and relative scaling metrics built into our <clears throat> J750. And then <clears throat> we also, as you know, Pantone encompasses a lot more colors, but we do encompass a good amount of Pantone colors. So it's currently in the works. Stratus is working with Pantone, and we will be releasing, well, Stratus will be releasing a Pantone book for the J750 of all the Pantone colors that J750 can print reliably. So once you get into voxel printing, that's where you can start, you know, pushing the limits by creating your own intricacies, but that is a whole other level of detail that most people won't get into. So here's the RGB spectrum on top of your visible light. Here's your Pantone for all your fabrics and plastics. Here's the area that we play around in. Note how small. And then, yeah, note the, uh, stop beeping. So it changes slightly. We have a little bit more wiggle room with the J750 and the J350 for creating of colors because we do it in a very interesting way. We're layer. We're layering down, you know, the CMYK, but because it's more of a translucent clear without a white backdrop, we actually add in our white. We're able to hit a lot different, um, I'll say, borderline colors that are on the edge of this uh, box, as opposed to the paper, which is always on a paper kind of a white background. So that is where that one comes from. All right, so here's our kind of CMYK versus the RGB summary. So note we are playing in the CMYK zone. So most of the rules for any CMYK versus RGB will be true when you're talking to your customers about matching your colors on our system of the J750. Also, um, this one more. There we go. So here is an absolute versus relative scaling. So note, say you have, you know, a designer who designs certain colors out of gambit or out of our gamut uh, box. So how do we want to scale that? In your advanced slicer in the Stratasys um, GrabCAD system, you can do an absolute, which will bring all the colors to the absolute value as they can. But they keep the other colors in that gambit at the exact same position. This is a practice for when you're trying to match, say, a logo, and you have to get within a certain um, shade. This is where you'd want to use absolute. 90 plus percent of the time, you're actually going to be using relative, which is this one over here. So watch, relative means you keep the distances relative to each other. So when you move these into the border, you move those equally down towards the center 
of the pure white spectrum so that you keep everything in the same relative, I'll say, frame of mind where it still looks like these three colors are the dark, bolder colors and these three are the pastel. This way, this looks like, you know, a bolder pastel and this looks lighter. It's not, it doesn't have that stark contrast. So relative will be your friend for majority of your uh, time, of your needs for, you know, color matching. And then a lot of people ask, well, why don't we convert colors? You know, they're all numbers in digital world, right? Well, there isn't really a science to it because once we convert it back, we never get the same thing out. So this conversion step, different conversion softwares do it better and get closer, but there isn't an easily accessible, widely known, easy way to go in and out back to where you came from. So note, the more steps you put into this process, the farther away your colors will be off. So the little trick here is get it from the source, get the native uh, like Photoshop or Illustrator file and then move on with it. Don't, don't send back and forth and dabble in this middle area going back and forth between these and then going back. Like you want to take the path once and be done because you're going to be already off by the time you reach the end of it. So the less time you play with transitioning between CMYK and back to RGB, you want to stick with one format and stay with it. Otherwise you'll have all sorts of uh, issues. And then, yes, just like with all of our other parts and issues with 3D printing, there are tolerances. Note, delta E is one standard deviation of the uh, color spectrum. So here's, you know, 14 delta E, here's 126 delta E's. I'm terrible with colors, so this looks pretty much like two, maybe three blues to me. Other people are able to actually see the 14 different ones. If your screen's calibrated, maybe you can see a little bit more. Here's 126 Delta E's in between it. You can see you can see a lot easier transition with your eyes. So keep that in mind when you're looking at color printers in general. A lot of people start saying, oh, we have 10 million combinations. There's technically an infinite amount of color combinations you can make, but there's only about two and a half million that the human eye can see. So having 10 million possibilities, but you're only visibly able to see two of that doesn't really help you. Um, so unless you're, I guess, advertising to, uh, was it the was it mantis shrimp? We actually have 16 color cones in their eyes and can see so many more colors than we can. Then yeah, you don't really need the 10 million color combinations because 2 million is more than enough to satisfy every designer's ability to see. And then, uh, yeah, here's a little bit more calculations, but yeah. So I'd like to thank everybody for spending time with us today. We got another one this afternoon, and um, the rest of this week we have two more a day. So thank you very much, and everybody have a great one.